Um, my name's Dan and I'm one of Hertfordshire's resident beetle nerds and basically that means I spend most of my time looking for beetles where I can and trying to record where they are to help sort of plot uh, distributions and things like that. Um, before we start, I want to go into what a moth trap intruder actually is. Um, a moth trap intruder is anything that appears in a moth trap that isn't a moth. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm going to focus today on beetles because beetles are my thing, um, but uh, lots of different things do appear in moth traps. Um, before we begin, I would like to know how many people actually run a moth trap and if you do, what kind of moth trap do you run? So I think there's going to be a little poll popping up. We'll go from there. There it is. Just to let everybody know, this poll is anonymous. We can't see what you've put, so don't worry um, about, about anything being traced back to you. We encourage as many people as possible. Wow, that's flying up, Dan, actually. Yeah, I know. We need to encourage you. Got nearly 200 responses. There, 200 already. Wow. Okay, I'll just, I'll give 10 more seconds, Dan, and then I'll stop it and share it so you can talk about it. That's, that's really interesting. So today, quite a lot of people don't actually have moth traps, which is quite fun. Um, I don't actually have a moth trap myself, and you don't need a moth trap to look at moth trap intruders. You just need to know someone who does have a moth trap. It's as simple as that. Um, you can also make moth traps using um, light bulb sheets, that kind of thing. Um, but that's a different thing for a different day, and there are plenty of places online. There's lots of moth trapping, um, Facebook groups and things like that that can help you with that, if that is something you're interested in doing. Oh, we all done? Cool. So, okay, so um, yeah, there are 4,000 beetles in the UK. Um, there's loads of different ways in which you find them. Um, amongst them, there's beating where you bash stuff out of the tree. Um, you can aspirate stuff using a pooter. Um, you can grub around, which is just using your hands. Essentially, there's a pile of poo there. There's a reason I've got gloves on. Um, we also use sieving, which is another good way, um, and we use lots of different types of traps. Uh, and my favourite by far is probably sweeping. A uh, big old net running around a the field, there's nothing quite like it. The only problem with all these is that they take quite a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of time to process through things and things like that. Um, so I'm always on the lookout to find easy ways to find good beetles, essentially. Um, in almost every single paper and publication and bit of paper you read about uh, beetles, there is this line that is usually at the bottom of some species descriptions and it will say attracted to light. This was found at light, at light on sunny day sort of thing. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because I enjoy digging in piles of manure too much or through carrion and things like that and it comes more naturally to me. It was something that I didn't really go into quite early on. Um, again, as I said, like quite a lot of my neighbours probably weren't happy if I was going to put a big old beacon in my back garden so it was something that I kind of pushed to the side um, but I was out in this uh, beautiful beautiful summer's day and I was sweeping a bit of bramble and then I came across this, this guy who sort of appeared his name is Keith and uh, Keith Cherry and he sort of turned up and he's like, oh what are you doing are you looking for butterflies I was like no I'm looking for beetles all these things and he happened to mention in passing that he ran a moth trap and he actually lived very close to where I live so I was like, oh, I'm getting on this. This is great. This is fantastic. So I gave him my details. I said, if there is anything that turns up in your trap, beetle wise, let me know and I'll come over um, and I'll help you do that for you. And we'll idea and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out what's in the area. And he was really excited about this. And I didn't actually hear anything from a little while. It was about four months later. Um, and then I got a little text. I was like, oh, Dan, I found something in my trap and um, sent me a picture. I was like, oh, that looks really exciting. It was this. This is our hopeless rusticus. It's a really nice big longhorn. Um, it favours conifers, mainly Scots pine and Norway spruce. And it turns out there was a plantation of conifers less than a mile away from both our houses. So that was perfect. There are two very, very similar species. This is rusticus. There's another one called ferris, um, our hopeless ferris. And the way you split them is looking at the hairs on the eyes. And there's a few other little nuances as well, but they're sort of the main ones that you can do quite easily. Um, Keith was like, I'm pretty sure it's Rusticus, but I'm not really sure what's out there. And I luckily had a big old book of beetles, went round and keyed it out properly. And I was like, oh yeah, it's definitely that, that's fantastic. And I was like, this is a big beetle. And it wasn't hard to ID, but obviously you need that specialist literature to be able to know what's happening, all that knowledge um, to be able to split them that easily. And I was thinking, well, this is a really, really big beetle. This is like two and a half centimeters. If, if Keith is struggling to split this from another species, then what, what else is there that he might be missing in that trap? And I, I kind of got thinking and I was like, well, also this is a really exciting thing that's appeared in a moth trap. What am I missing from not 
being involved with moth traps more often. So I went on to social media and at this time I was using social media to sort of help myself learn because you can look at what people are posting on social media and you can try and key it out, try and work it out yourself. You can use different idea resources that you wouldn't usually go near because you're in different parts of the country where you wouldn't find those things. Um, and then I found this web page here and this was made by um, Steve French, who's actually, I believe, in this call. And he had basically started this page to put things up that appeared in his moth trap that he didn't know what it was and it wasn't a moth and there were some really interesting things on here and they were sort of popping up and when this began this is probably about four or five years ago now um you would have oh is anyone anyone good at weevils is, does anyone know what this is and these are quite easy to id if you have the knowledge or you have the um available resources near you or you know where those resources are quite a lot of these have free resources already out there but people just didn't know where they were um so i was like right well, there's loads of beetles on here that aren't sort of being checked over um i found my place i'm going to sit here for a little bit and try and help everyone out and hopefully learn something along the way but the great thing was it isn't just beetles that were appearing on moth trap intruders there were all kinds of things we have wasps and caddis flies and and all these crazy things and and eventually we're getting lots of people that are now coming to this page that have really good knowledge of these really interesting groups to hopefully help everyone out obviously i'm here for beetles so uh let's talk beetles First of all, um, why beetles in my trap? Um, it's really common knowledge um, that wide range of insects are attracted to light, and people in people in light traps tend people beetles in light traps tend to fall into three main categories. There are those that are actively attracted to light. Um, this is actually the smallest group, I, in my opinion. Um, but when they do appear, they can appear in droves. They, they can happen all at once and they can be pretty insane, but we'll discuss that a bit later. Um, we also have uh, groups that are attracted by prey. Um, so these things could be things like large predatory beetles. They sort of turn up, oh, there's a lot of movement over here. Let's have a little gander. Um, and they sometimes take a bit of a munch to some of the moths, which obviously mothers aren't a giant fan of. Um, and then there are the other ones. These are the ones that are just lost, basically. Um, they just turn up there. Uh, weevils, I think, are, are a good example of this. They tend to fall in um, to things quite easily. If the trap is underneath a plant or underneath a tree that they might be in, if they're knocked out, they just drop. Their natural defense mechanism is to pull in their legs and just drop. And they, they sometimes just fall in. Simple as that. Um, if you want to find beetles and you're using a moth trap, there are some little tricks, um, but the most important one is you have to work your trap. You can't just let it do its thing. Um, the best time of day or morning um, is between one and three, uh, from what I've heard from people, my personal experience. Um, this is uh, my friend William, who um, is trapping. Uh, he would call me when he's got a trap out and he'd be like, there's loads of beetles coming in. It would usually be about one in the morning. I would jump in my car, fly down, and we would sit there and find all these beetles together. And it's, it's a great time. You tend to find after about three o'clock, everything starts to drop off. And um, so one and three, search your traps. Um, you can use the wall behind them. Lots of beetles don't actually go in the trap. They just hit the wall beside, or you can put a you can put a sheet down underneath the trap, which is something that quite a lot of people do. This is quite a good practice anyway, because you get quite a lot of cool moths this way as well. So two birds, one stone. Um, most beetles are gone by morning. So yeah, just um, get out there, make a cup of tea, you know, make a bit of an evening with it, grab a friend if you can, um, obviously pandemic permitting. Uh, but yeah, essentially it's the early bird gets the worm, but in this case, it's a beetle. And um, that's what I found within about an hour of beetles. There's a few doubles in there, but quite a lot of those were different species, really, really productive early in the morning. So the usual suspects here, and this is absolute carnage. You can quite literally see the absolute chaos in this picture. Um, usual suspects tend to be very seasonal and they tend to occur in large numbers and they are all attracted to light actively. This is Harpless Roof Pays. Um, it has big red legs, let's get a bigger picture. There it is. It's got big red legs and it's got this really nice golden sheen on the back of its elytra, uh, like the wing cases. Sometimes this wears off, so it's not as obvious, but if you catch it in the right light, you'll see this really nice golden fuzz over the top. Until quite recently, um, this was the only species that would look like this in your trap. Um, unfortunately, probably, I think it was the late 90s, um, this sort of turned up and this is appearing in traps a bit more commonly now. It's definitely on the up. It's still very, very sparsely distributed and I feel like it might be being overlooked quite a lot. This is Harpalus grisius. 
Um, it's a bit smaller, it's on average smaller. So a half litre of five piece is really big. It's 11 to 16 mil. Um, Grisius is on the smaller end of that scale, eight to 12 mil. Um, one of the, the easiest ways to sort of split this, if you think, oh, there's loads of these, they all kind of look the same in your trap. Go for the smaller specimens first, have a look at them. And then you can start to look at the pronotums. If you look at the pronotums, the shape is in general a bit different. It's not the most reliable feature, but it's a good feature to go, ah, oh, actually this might be worth a bit of a closer look. So in half litre and five piece, it's got this really nice curve that you can see on the left-hand side. Um, this is a quite an extreme example. It can be less than that sometimes. And if you look at Grisius, it's a lot more straight. It's less of a curve. And um, there's a little line there to sort of demonstrate that. It's not a hard, fast rule. There are definitely versions of both on the grand scheme of things. But the cincher, the absolute cincher is if you think, do you know what, this could be it, and you've got handlings on you, flip it over or up, and then on the underside of the abdomen, there's a strip of hair down the center of Grisius uh, on the abdominal um, sternites. And this has given it the nickname um, of the Brazilian beetle because it's got quite, quite frankly, it's got Brazilian. Um, whereas for five piece has the opposite where it lacks that strip down the middle, but it has hair the other sides where everywhere apart from the middle essentially. Um, another really, really common one, there's small brown jobs here on the left-hand side are Bradycellis um, vivasci. And there's another species as well, Hoploides. Very, very similar, and um, they are a faff to split, but anything that is small brown and looks like that on the left, most likely is going to be a Bradycellus. They can appear in droves as well, really, really common. Um, by far, in my experience, I find that Vivasque is a lot more common than Harpaloides, and um, they will require probably a decent microscope to split them reliably. There is a bit of a shape difference, but um, I would find it very difficult to split them. Um, Aphodius rufipi on the right-hand right side is a really nice dung beetle. It's probably one of the largest um, species of this group, Aphodius um, dung beetle. They can be split really easily just because of the size. They're really big. That's 9 to 13 mil, which is the bigger end of Aphodius species. And they've got this beautiful curve on the front of their head. It's a semicircle, and that splits it from the others, um, which tend to be a bit more angular, a bit more flat. And um, it's got this wonderful corrugated iron looking elytra wing cases as well, which can be split it. Um, really, really nice species, one of my favorites to be quite honest. Again, they can appear and moth trappers do shake their fists in rage when lots and lots appear, hundreds at a time, and it annoys them because all their moths get kicked about. Um, I just think they're great and they, they, they get rid of all the cowpoo for us, so that's fantastic. Um, Another group that are really, really common are Aphonus ardeus. Um, Aphonus in general are quite common. Um, they can be split quite easily um, just because they're really, really speckled on the top. They, they've got this dappling effect. They're quite hairy as well. Um, if you've got something that looks like that, it's probably an Aphonus. Um, and Ardo sciaticus is, is a big blue one, essentially. Um, it's pronotum, uh, this part here. Um, oh. Uh, it's, it's rounded, so the pronotum, the head pronotum, and then the uh, elytra. So it's got this curved sides, which are quite nice, big red legs, and it's got this amazing metallic blue colour. It can be slightly green. Yeah, that's that's it. That's a, that's a phonus alias actus. But these are the most common ones that you'll find in your traps. Um, you'll also get this. This is Heliphorus. There's lots of these. Uh, I think there's 20 species. I wouldn't recommend trying to split them unless that's something you really want to do in your life. I have a go every so and often, um, but for beginners to beetles, it's not something I would recommend getting into straight away. From a distance, they are very small and they are very brown and very nondescript. But if you get them under the scope or a hand lens or look at them closely, you can see these amazing ridges and these colors and the metallicness of them. They are fantastic things. These are actually um, water scavenging beetles and they get confused by moth traps because they just think they're reflections in pools of water and they kind of try and land. I get them quite a lot on my glass table at home. They, they, they kind of fall for the same trick, bless them. Uh, the most common out of the ones that I have seen in moth traps seems to be Brevacella. Uh, Brevacolis, sorry. Um, but yeah, it's a species, they're not fun to do, but as a genus, they are very easy to get there. So if you go, do you know what? These wonderful grooves, it's quite small. They tend to be about five mil, maybe a bit less. Yeah, fantastic things. The other group of beetles that kind of fall into that, that horrible trick of thinking that a light trap is actually a, a bit of water that's just reflecting light are the water beetles. And the the biggest one that you will find is this one. This is the great silver warting water beetle. It's huge. It's an absolute monster of a beetle. It's fantastic. Um, it's got these clubbed antenna to separate it from the other big water beetles, which are um, Dystichus or Dystichus. I can never pronounce things properly. Um, the great 
diving beetles. One thing people don't realize is they'll take pictures of these and oh yeah, like, can you ID this? It's, it's really good. Um, they can be quite difficult. There's actually six species within the UK that look very similar. The easiest way to split them is just to flip them over. And if you look at these little bits at the bottom of the leg there, you will see this shape is quite indicative of a species. You can split pretty much any species by looking at the underside and seeing the shape of that. And the color as well is quite important. And you can, you can get a really nice, reliable identification from anything that looks vaguely like that from your trap. They are nice close-ups. You can see that really cool pointing shape there. So these are species that are really quite a lot of their distribution data actually comes from moth traps. And it, it highlights that a lot of data from moth traps can be really, really important. I have never seen either of these not in a moth trap or not near a moth trap before. The one on the left, um, the Lista dicarus, is a rove beetle. And it's a miracle in itself because it's a rove beetle that's incredibly easy to identify. It looks like this, essentially. It's got this nice red color. Um, it's got shorter wing cases. If it looks like that, seven mil about, um, it's one of these. And it's a, it's a delight. It's an absolute delight, let's be quite honest. The one on the right um, is Odomira femoralis. This is related to the swollen fied flower beetles that you find quite a lot on flowers, big green things. And um, this is its nighttime cousin, I guess. Uh, really big and really leggy species as well. And it's got this kind of duck bill shaped head that slits it. Um, there's nothing in the UK list that looks anything like that. So if you've got that, you can put an idea on that straight away. Really fantastic thing. Obviously, we can't go into moth traps without talking carrier beetles. And yeah, they're, they're very well covered. And um, there's an amazing, there's an amazing recording scheme um, for Silphids, this is the group that they're in, and they have made amazing resources. There's loads of information. There's maps and ideas. There's this book that's fantastic that we've already talked about. Um, it's got everything in it. It's amazing. So if you're interested in them and you're getting them in your trap, definitely get that book. It's amazing. Um, and they've made all these resources, they're everywhere. And so many people don't realize they're there and they are, and they're great and they're fantastic. So if you do get these in a trap and you want to ID them, just go for it. And make sure you record that information as well because the Silphid recording scheme will use that to map distribution and look at trends and things like that. Really, really fun. And um, the important things to look at are the antennal color and the shape of the hind legs and also where this yellow fuzz is. So on some of the species, Nicophorus vestigator in the bottom left, you can see it quite clearly. Um, it's really nice yellow fuzz on its head and on the front of its pronotum and on its bum and everywhere. Really, really nice things. Um, if you get a picture, make sure you've got all those. And it's as simple as that. And from decent pictures with those ID characteristics, you can identify anything that vaguely looks like one of these beetles in your moth trap. So there's no excuse. It's fantastic. In order of um, how common they are in moth traps, um, Nicophorus humata, which is the big black one, is the most common. We've then got Investigator second, um, Litteralis, Vespaloides, um, Phosphuca atrata, which is an interesting, which I'll touch back on in a second. Um, Vespilio, uh, Interruptus, and Vestigator. So that's the order. So Humator is by far the most common, and Vestigator is by far the least common found in traps. And thank you, Ashley Whiffin, for giving me that information because that's really helpful. Phosphuga atrata that I touched on is one of those species that you will only find by your trap um, on sheets or on the back wall and things like that. So that's the only time you find them. They don't really appear in traps. So again, that highlights that the way that you use your trap can give rise to actually what you're actually finding in there. Um, obviously, Silphid UK, which is their uh, Twitter handle, um, any interesting things, whack on there, and they take all their records to I record. I'll go into that a bit later on as well. Um, in the carrying beetles, the one that people get confused a lot are these two black ones. I get it, they're big, they're black, they kind of look quite similar. The easiest way to split them um, is using their antenna. Um, so in Litteralis on the left-hand side, it's quite a thin antenna that are expanded. And on the right, Humata has got this clubbed antenna. And um, also, if you look at Litteralis on the left, the legs are quite big and bulky, a bit frog-legged, I think of it, and Humata is less so. Um, it's a bit more angled. It's, it's kind of almost triangular, to be honest. Nice. Let's talk dung beetles. I love a dung beetle, and they're probably one of my favorite groups, to be quite honest. Um, and any excuse to, to go in dung is, is great by me, but for people who are less inclined to dig through dung, um, moth traps are the way forward. So, minotaur beetles, big, 
nice bulky species. The males have these great horns on the front and the female, which is the one on the left, has less so of a horn and it's kind of, kind of got like tiny little pinches. Uh, the males use their horns for um, like pushing things out of their burrow. They actually live underneath cow pats and things like that in, in big or any kind of dung, to be quite honest. Um, and they live, they can dig really, really deep burrows, um, which they'll lay their eggs in and things like that. So that's, they're really, really cool, really funky species, to be quite honest. We've also got this guy. This is the um, Ondontius. Again, it's got this wonderful horn. This is an incredibly rare species in the UK. Um, it's common in Europe, um, but males have this amazing horn and they feed on dung and fungus in underground tunnels, much like their minotaur beetles. Um, if you find one of these in your trap, record it. Um, there is a great recording scheme, the UK Scarabs uh, recording scheme. There's a thing that's going to appear probably in the chat in a minute. Um, a great thing, or British Scarabs, I believe it's called actually. Um, we also have bull beetles, and so these are anything in the genus Geotrupes. There's quite a few of them. The Minotaur and the um, Ondontius are quite easy to ID if you've got a decent picture of them. Door beetles can be a bit more of a faff, and um, that's mainly because some of their ID characteristics are on the underside. Um, so there's a pair, uh, Geotrupes, Spinager, and Ceracoriaris, I think it is. Um, you have to either look at where their heads are on the underside or at the shape of the side of their mandible, which can be a pain to get in a picture. Um, also, you need to make sure that the stri, which are the ridges on the wing cases, are, are kind of, you know, like covered by all angles are in focus because you can count those as well. Um, so those are things. So if you get a door beetle like that on the bottom right, sometimes it's better to, to flip them over and just take a quick picture underneath or just see if there's any hairs down the centre of their, um, their bottom abdomen, I guess. Um, chafers, which are cool as well. They're not as cool as long beetles, but they're pretty cool. Um, we actually have two species of cock chafer in the UK or maybugs. They are big, big things, um, about 20 to 30 mil. And so definitely on the larger end of the beetle scale of size in the UK. Um, if you're anywhere north of the Pennines, sort of like north of Sheffield, um, it's worth looking out for the other one, which is the uh, Melanotha the Kandastani. Um, you can split it using some identification uh, documents that Darren Mann and Kerry Mann have helped produce. Um, I will send links to those later. They are fantastic things. If you get in the Northern Chafer, it's an amazing thing to get and make sure it's recorded because it's one of those that very rarely appears and we would like to know where it is. Um, there's loads and loads of ID resources um, from the British Scarab recording scheme. So definitely check them out if you're getting stuff like this in your trap. Um, this is the Brown Chafer, a bit smaller. Um, I really like them. They've got big old blobby eyes and they're just a bit cute, bless them. Uh, a lot smaller than the rest, but they look like that. And there's not much else on the UK list that does look like that, to be quite honest. Um, as mentioned already, British Scarabs, let them know. There's Twitter, there's a Facebook, there's all these things. And they've got a website, which will appear in the chat. A fantastic thing. And there's loads of resources on there as well to help you find those things. Not just by using the moth flowers. Um, Longhorn beetles, another great group. This is the lesser thorn. This appears time to time. It's quite common in the UK. You can knock a bit of hawthorn. You might just like to find it in sort of the spring months. Um, however, moth traps do have this gem, which is the tanner beetle, which is absolutely freaking huge. It's like 18 to 45 mil. It's probably the bulkiest species in the UK we have. Um, it lives in wood as a larvae for about three years before finally coming out. The males on the bottom have this really cool, like serrated saw-like antenna. And they are terrifying, to be honest. They look terrifying. They are completely harmless. They're just really big. Bless them. Um, I love them. I think they're great. And I've, I've seen a few alive in the UK. And I remember the first time I saw one and I legitimately thought it was like a foreign runaway or something. No, nope, it's one of ours and they're great. Um, we've also got our Hopkins rusticus, which we've always discussed. Um, there are a few other longhorns that kind of appear, but these are kind of the big ones that appear. There is a longhorn recording scheme. If you're getting stuff like this, they've got a Twitter, they've got a Facebook, um, and obviously they want all your records and pictures. So that's fine. Um, moth trap rarities. These are cool. So this is Orchesia undulata. Um, this is a very small beetle. It's five millimeters. Um, it lives and feeds in decaying wood and the fungi that exists in there. Um, we also have the Tasmanian eucalyptus beetle, which uh, appeared in 2007 in Ireland, and uh, then we found it in London 2012, I think it was, um, and we've had quite a few instances of it appearing in the south. Um, this was originally imported on eucalyptus plants, as you can guess, from Tasmania. Um, it comes in a few different colour forms, but 
it just looked crazy, to be quite honest. If you find this, definitely, definitely log it. That's a great thing. That is an amazing thing. And we've also got this teeny tiny little ladybird. Uh, this is 3.2 millimeters. Um, it's a recent addition to the British list. It didn't exist um, in the UK before about 2014. Well, we didn't find it until then, at least. Um, it's an Australian species. Um, it was introduced into France and Italy for control of olive scale plants. So um, olive scale insects, which is really fun. Um, a very small and very easily overlooked species. It's essentially it looks like a tiny little ladybird with this beautiful like fuzz. Uh, it's like silver fuzz over it, and that's that's how you stick it. So if you get teeny tiny little ladybirds, that's the one to have. Um, other cool ones. Let's look for some monsters. So this is the hornet road beetle. I like birds as well. To be honest, but it's a beetle, so why wouldn't I? Um, it's actually a species that lives in hornet's nests and eats all the gunk in there and, and things like that. Um, it used to be incredibly rare, uh, which is probably due to the fact that hornets weren't doing too well. Uh, but now it's making a bit of a comeback. Hornets seem to be doing a bit better. It looks very similar to the, the common devil's coach horse beetle, but it's, it's slightly different. Its antenna are a bit more saw shaped. That it's not long and thread like, like the devil's coach horse. And also the pronotum, the bit behind the head, it's, it's almost shield shaped. It's, it's very circular, whereas in the devil's coach horse beetle, it's, it's a lot more squared off. And um, we also have this guy. This is the bombardier beetle, uh, Brachylinus greptans. Um, it sprays irritant um, puffs of smoke when it, it gets a bit annoyed. Uh, it just smells quite bitter, to be quite honest. It, it looks fun, but um, for me, as, as a human being, it doesn't do me much damage. I imagine if it's a lot smaller and I'm trying to eat it, it would be a very different kettle of fish. It's very obvious. It has this metallic green, bluey color uh, wing cases, and then it's red all over. Uh, it used to be entirely coastal in distribution, pretty much. Uh, but in the last few years, it's started to sort of work across the south. And it seems to mobilize when air temperatures are about 20 degrees and up. And that's when it sort of hits the air and just goes for it. Uh, catches the slipstream, just it goes around and disperses, which is really fun. Um, we also have uh, Panageus. Um, these are really rare. There's two species in the UK, uh, Crux Major and Bipastellatus. And um, they look very similar. They look superficially similar to the Nicophorus and Silphid beetles we were discussing earlier. Um, but the heads are a bit different. They just, uh, they just look a bit different, to be fair. Um, to separate the two, you need to look at the pronotum shape, which is the bit on the head, the top of the thorax. If you get a half decent picture, you can ID them quite easily. So if you do see something like that and you're not sure what it is, take a picture of it and then we can do it. That's a great record. If you get that, your county beetle recorder is going to be a love in life. That's, that's a great thing to have. Uh, very, very rare species, so great. Uh, one thing I want to get ahead as well is that people overlook small things quite a lot. They sort of go, oh, it's less than three mil, oh, it's less than four mil, and they assume it's incredibly hard to split, and that's, that's just not the case at all sometimes. Uh, you've got Megatoma here. Um, if something looks like that and it's got this cool, like, jazzy, like, zebra stripe kind of patination going on, you can tell what that is. There's nothing else that looks like that. Take a picture of it, put it on Facebook, um, get moth trap intruders, something like that, and someone will pick that up quite easily. It's a beautiful thing, lovely, lovely thing. Uh, we've got Alonium, uh, which again is very obvious as a beetle. Uh, yeah, it's brown, and everyone goes, Oh, it's a small brown beetle. What's the point? Um, the shape of it is mad, and um, it's got this crazy, like, indentations on its uh, on its pronotum. It's got this, like, this fork shape. It's just really cool. It's got this cool, like, clubbed antenna. Um, get a picture of that. We can tell you what that is quite easily. And um, we've also got Patinus. Patinus can be a difficult group to go through, but look how cool that looks. That's pretty cool, guys. I love that. Um, that's one of the spider beetles. So, yeah, really funky. Um, one thing I did want to discuss was this guy. This is Polystichus connexus. And this, this is mad. This is a great story. So, historically, um, it was confined to that coast. And the majority of records from the 70s were on the southeast coast in uh, the Kent and East Sussex. So, before then, you know, it wasn't much. This is just uh, data from my records. It's not all the data, but it, it, it displays my point. So I'm going to use it. It's a lot easier to use these maps than some apps and somewhere else. In uh, 2020, we started to, to get a few things kind of popping in. I think they first started to appear in 2019 on July the 26th is the date I've got. Um, after a really warm night, it's about 25 degrees at night. Um, and they popped up in Essex, Buckinghamshire and Hertz. Um, they're very flat. They're very flat species, which they, they kind of squeeze into rocks and bark and things like that. Uh, in 2020, we started to see them sort of pop up in people's traps. And it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is, this is fun. And, and then 
here we are. So this is where we are now, and they're, they're clearly spreading in the south. They like hot nights. If it's between about 22 and 30 degrees, I think the magic number is probably closer to about 25. Um, they seem to just appear. So if you are living in the south and you are running off that, and it is a particularly warm night, look out for these guys. Really obvious to ID. It's got these really cool like orange smudge marks. It's got this cool like oval shape, not oval, that's not about like hourglass, hourglass shape kind of pronotum. Just a really funky thing. That is a great record. And we're trying to track where they are going, going from and, and where they've been and things like that. So we do get these, record them on a record or something similar. Um, again, I'll just chat in a second. So why aren't beetles being recorded as much as they could be in the first? And I think, I think the question begins with this, and it's everyone always asks when they're trying to get into beetles is, what's the best book to ID beetles with? Or what's the best resource to ID beetles with? And the turn around and you'll go, yeah, no, um, well, there's, there's these three books here, they're pretty good, but they're, you know, they're very, very advanced, I would say. Um, you need a microscope to use these. And they're also a hundred pound of pops, that's 300 quid before the ban. That's not even the entire set. Um, but you've got these three things. These things are gate. There's um, there's Mike's insect keys, which is free. We've got some Silfrid uh, ID resources. We've got Mark Gurney's Weevil resources. They're all free. That's fantastic. Oh, you've also got these books, and these will cover some of the other stuff. And then there's this book, and and then before you know it, everyone's kind of glazed over, and they've walked off, and they've decided never to talk about Beatles again. And I think that's one of the main issues is that with Beatles, there isn't one main ID resource. There isn't one place to go to. And I think that does put people off and it, it does confuse people a little bit. Like, well, where do I begin? Like, what do I do? And, and people kind of just get a bit stuck. Really, the best Beatle info resources are scattered across bookshelves and literature and the internet. They're everywhere. And there's no, there's no one place to go to. So, I was like, okay, well, is there like a list of Beatles? Is there like, you know, stuff that people have found in Moffat? So I found, I searched on the internet, had a little gander, and I found this paper by Steve Lane and Darren Mann. And essentially, they had a jolly in the middle of 2004, in the summer, I think it was, and they wrote down everything they found in their traps. And that's great. There's, it's probably, a, it is a very comprehensive list, and there's stuff on there that people wouldn't really be able to idea because these guys are, are hardcore Beatle nerds. And um, <laughs> yeah, they've ID quite a lot of stuff. So there's, a few things in there but that list was by no means complete i was finding things that definitely wasn't on that list and stuff like that and that was a small snapshot of that section of time and um, i then found this this is the uk beatles page which is loads of really good information very in-depth information and um, but they had a nice list of beatles tracks to like again lots of things missing uh, i then found martin harvey's list on kite net um, and yeah, this was great because it had loads of stuff and it had flies and caddis flies and things like that and some beetles. But again, none of these are really complete. So it's like, well, actually, can I just throw this all together, maybe? Because there's a lot of information here and there's a few other sorts of information as well from like the back of journals and things like that. But essentially, there was no easy way to narrow species down and go, oh, this has never been found in a trap before. This has been found in a trap before. So... Basically, I'd realized that great records are potentially going to be overlooked or missed. We've got information sources that are all over the shop, even free stuff is just everywhere. It's, it's, it's around the internet. Um, and there's there's no real amalgamated list of things that people have found. Um, I, I use comprehensive in the quotes there because I think comprehensive is a very broad term to throw around, um, but as complete as possible would probably be more accurate. Um, and also people who are recording and finding these things don't know what features to take pictures of to be able to allow people to ID from photos. And I think that's another big issue. You go to a trap in the morning, you take all the things, you take a picture of the thing, you let it go. Um, and then you go, oh, well, actually, if you would have taken a picture from this angle, you probably would have been able to get an ID. And I think that's incredibly infuriating as a moth trapper. If, and also, if you want people to make records for you, you've got to make it as easy as possible. So what can we do? Well, we can put all the information in the same place or signpost that information. Um, we can raise awareness. Um, look at your traps. There's cool stuff. Let's look at the cool stuff in traps. Um, encourage that recording of stuff that isn't a moth in traps. And yeah, that, that was it. So what did, what did we decide to do? So I was talking to Steve French for a bit. Um, we, we were getting loads of really cool stuff appearing on this uh, Moth Trap Intruders page. And I thought, you know what? Let's, let's do something. So my lockdown thing was to build a website. Um, my website has a list of species, it's got photo tips, um, 
links to recording schemes. It's got links to all the online resources. It's got links to non-online resources. And it, it's kind of all there. It's, it's by no means complete and it's definitely a work in progress. But I tried my absolute best to try and get all this information together and just to allow people to be able to record things and get IDs and things like that as easy as possible. It's all in one place. And yeah, that's that's where I'm going with that. So that's tarsayintegulate.co.uk. It's on there. You can click on it. There's pictures of beetles. You click on that beetle. If it looks, hopefully looks similar to what you found, and it should take you to a list of things that look similar. If it's not on there, which it might not be, um, I have written a list as well where I've put everything together. So hopefully you might be able to find something on there. Um, it is a work in progress. I need people to use it. I need people to tell me this isn't working or this is working. And then we can sort of fine tune this process because ultimately I just want all these beetles to be recorded so we all know what it is and what we're actually finding in moth traps. Um, also, Steve, um, who, Steve French, who is the, the guy that does the Moth Trap Intruders Facebook page, um, he is the absolute beginner, like not beginner, absolute mod of wisdom. Um, he's a really good guy at Caddisflies. Um, he looks at the stuff that comes in on that page and he looks at trends and he looks at, he, he tries to work out like monthly lists and things like that. And that's great. But Facebook does have its limitations. And I think it's very difficult to go back in time. You don't necessarily have all the data that we would particularly like, things like light types and stuff like that. Um, so before I go to my next slide, I want to know who actually uses iRecord. So if we can whack that poll up, guys, and see who actually uses this iRecord. Look at that. That's cool, that's cool. So we've got a few that use it quite regularly and we've got probably an equal amount that have it, but don't use it. And then we've got a slight snippet of people that don't have iRecord at all. So iRecord is essentially um, a, a website or a service that you can put biological records onto and that they can be verified by verifiers. And they can also, that they go into recording schemes and they feed into these recording schemes. And I, I was a bit inspired because I went on uh, Kieran's, one of Kieran's talks is discovering iRecord courses. And I learned quite a lot about iRecord. And I, I've had an iRecord account for probably about four years. And he was like, oh, you can do this thing with an activity. And I was like, well, what on earth do you mean, Kieran? Like, what, what is this thing? And essentially you can make an activity where, so you can see the data, even if you're not a verifier. So. Here it is. So we made this made this record activity. Um, it has been ongoing for the last two days. So it's brand spanking new. Essentially, it is a way of allowing us to look at snapshots of data that are being submitted into iRecord. And these records still do the same thing that they would usually do. So they still can be verified by verifiers and they still go into those recording schemes. So all those recording schemes we were talking about earlier, um, you can this all goes to those people. And basically what we've done is we've made a way that if you submit your records through the Moth Trap Intruders activities um, bar, so if you click on activities at the top, this will come out. You can search for Moth Trap Intruders in the search box. It will come up and you can add yourself to that activity. You can then submit your iRecord stuff into that activity. So this is for Moth Trap Intruders only, so anything that is not a moth. So this could be birds, bats. It could be anything that's in a moth trap. But beetles as well, obviously. Um, this will then go through and it allows um, us people at Moth Trap Intruders to look at that and be able to use that data and we can pull together things like monthly stuff and things like that. And um, it's just a, a lot easier for us to be able to look at that information rather than have to trawl through different ways of doing that. Um, one thing to note about this though is that if you have input stuff into iRecord already, don't put it back in this route because you duplicate those records and it causes carnage for all of the verifiers and all of the recording schemes so only new records can really we want being put into here or ones that haven't been entered into iRecord data is data and we love data so if it hasn't been entered onto iRecord or through another channel then please whack them through and if they're from a moth trap please whack them through this activity so we can see them so what can you do as a moth trapper well we want you to generate those records um 
We have all kinds of Beatles and loads of them have active recording schemes and many are doing crazy, crazy things distribution wise. And um, it's important we don't miss those key finds through a lack of sharing information. And this isn't just for Beatles, it's for all kinds of things that appear in moth traps. Um, it's cool if you don't know what it is, someone else might. So use those different channels um, and take images, use the photo guides that are on my website and whack them on the moth trap intruders page. And let's just do this. Just, just get some data guys. Um, it's important that entomologists and all kinds of work together and we can share that knowledge with, with everyone to help see the bigger picture and know actually what we really do have in the UK. So uh, that's, that's it guys. Well Dan, fascinating talk. There was a lot covered there so I think there's probably going to be a lot of questions. If people want to ask a question, if they could raise their hand. Um, I will be biased towards people who raise their hand over the chat questions, so we'll give people a chance to, to so if you want to cut the queue, it's, it's all about raising your hand and not being shy. If anybody wants to turn on their videos now, they're welcome to as well. We're happy to see you, but you might be recorded, so bear that in mind. Um, right, okay, so... We've got nobody with their hand up. So I think we might go to, um, I forgot who it was. I forgot which help it was. Can, can whoever's got the chat questions on mute and ask Dan the first question, please. Hi, yeah. Um, so the first question we got is, uh, it was kind of answered in the chat, this one, but it was about um, the danger to moths um, in a moth trap when there's too much light or like anything in the moth trap. Um, it basically think, said, yeah. I think like I, I am not a hardcore moth, so I, I can't put a really hardcore sort of overview onto that. Um, but I know that it is important that when you have moth moth traps running you need to have something in the bottom um, to allow them resting spaces. I know that when there are high influxes of beetles and things they can cause a bit of carnage in that trap. If you're working a trap properly um, and you are surveying that overnight then you can obviously remove those things. You can put them in a, a tub and then release them in the morning. There's no point releasing them in there because they'll just come straight back. Um, so you can do that. It's a bit of a faff um, but if you're concerned about the safety of your moths in a trap that's probably the best way of, of dealing with that. Brilliant, thanks Dan. Dan, just so you know, because I'm not sure if you're aware, but Ashley Whiffin is actually on the call. Oh, well. I, I know everyone's on, I can see them all. <laughs> so we're saying hi. Loads of great useful links about, um, about sylphids in there. And if people are interested in learning more about sylphids specifically, I'd recommend watching Ashley's Natural History Live. Oh. That she, did with us. she was our first ever one. And uh, that's an introduction to carrion beetles. So it's on our YouTube channel. Um, right, we've still got no hands up. I can't believe well, I, I saw I saw a comment in the chat that said that I didn't address click beetles. And you're right, I didn't. Um, I, I just ran out of time, to be honest. Uh, Kieran was like, "Can you can you talk for half an hour about beetles?" I was like, "Kieran, I could talk probably about two hours easily on beetles." So I had to to cut that down just so everyone can actually see it. Um, click beetles do appear in traps. Uh, Melanotus, the big black ones, are quite common. They're a bit difficult to split, but they are quite common. And there's some really funky ones. On my website, there is everything on there. So loads of things I haven't covered. There's a lot. Loads of them are on there. Have a look and hopefully be able to help with ID and stuff as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Heather, you put your hand up so you get to skip the queue. If you can unmute. I was going to ask how common an orange ladybird was in a trap. Um, I know that all ladybirds can turn up in traps. Um, yeah, they... They're not the most common out of ladybirds by far, um, and it's definitely worth recording. Um, the ladybird recording team would love data like that, so that's really great. Um, they, they are by no means rare. I would say they're on the uncommon side of common, um, just in general distribution terms, um, but they do occasionally turn up in moth traps. Are they right to me in? Okay. We had one last year, I think. Yeah, they're, they're quite nice little things, to be honest. I do like them. Um, I saw another question about chafers and when they appear. Um, it depends on the type of chafer, to be quite honest. Obviously, May bugs um, appear in May, um, and then quite a lot of the other chafers appear a bit later on. Uh, 
Um, for Beatles in general, um, the fun stuff starts to sort of appear sort of April onwards. Um, early summer is, is my favourite, but yeah, stuff can appear all, all year round within reason, but May mugs kind of have that, that in-between section of, of May, early June. Uh, Sonia, can we get a question from the chat? Yeah, sure. Um, so roughly the next one we had was talking about, um, you said about H. Rissius increasing in like common, in range basically, um, like in the south I think. Um, is it coming from the continent or is it just increasing because of conservation efforts or something like that? I, sorry, what, what beetle was that? Um, it just says here H. Grisius, so G R I S E S. Oh, Hubless, cool, yeah. Um, yeah, so Hubless, I'm not entirely sure, to be quite honest, and the best person to talk to is probably um, Chris from the uh, Ground Beetle Recording Scheme, um, but it's, it's just started to appear, and I think we're still in the very early days. It's only starting to appear in moth traps. Um, it's still, if you find it in your trap, you're probably gonna get county first, depending on where you are. Um, so it's one of those things that we, we really wanna keep an eye on to see actually what it's doing. Because quite frankly, we don't know. I think Chris is on the call. Oh, I think they all are. <laughs> I so Chris think wants to all answer there. that, he's welcome to answer. Um, in the meantime, uh, Amanda, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, my question is, um, if we record anything we find in a moth trap through iRecord, will it find its way through to the individual recording schemes? Is iRecord the first port of call? Um, it depends, quite frankly, on the recording scheme. Um, a lot, the recording schemes that I have discussed all use iRecord. I know they do because I've spoken to them. Um, it, it just depends, to be honest. iRecord is great because it's a reservoir of information, so you can always look at that historically back as well. Um, some recording schemes for Beatles are a bit iffy um some are great some are fantastic some prefer different things um but yeah it's it's basically down to that group of beetles to be honest, or, or that group of anything to be honest as well i know birds aren't fantastic for eye records i think they prefer a different way but i'm not entirely sure on that that's not to say that you shouldn't do it yeah with with eye record i think what's important to know if the, if nobody is verifying the records for a given group at this point in time that doesn't mean they won't be in the future so the example I like to give is five years ago, your sub records would have been ignored, but they're getting through all the backlog now. Ten years ago, the earthworm records wouldn't have been dealt with. Um, Ashley and the Sylphida team really took on their stuff not that long ago as well. Like it's yeah, same with Longhorn. So it gets better over time. So it's certainly not a waste of time putting them there. What you may need to do to get them to the recording scheme is download them from iRecord and then forward them on. And that's perfectly, perfectly acceptable as well. But what it will do is it will make them available to recording schemes if they want them. And it will make them available to local environmental record centers if they want them as well. And as Dan has pointed out, if you set up an activity, it means that other organizations, groups, initiatives can set it up so that they can get it as well. Um, all right, okay. Sonia, have we got another question from the chat? Yeah, there's another one here that is, what does past dishes connectus eat? Because apparently it's been increasing. But... You know, I have no Sorry, idea. Can I just ask something, Dad? Yeah. When you're answering these, when we've got the scientific names, can you just remind us what broad family, like what broad okay. family they are? Just, yeah. we might not have remembered all the same. This is, this is the um, the flat one that appeared um, quite recently, sort of 2019 onwards with the orange um, smudges on its wing cases. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it does eat, to be quite honest. Um, Chris, I don't know if you actually know, if you do, can you either whack that in the chat or whack a hand up? Because I, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's just one of those things that's kind of come up. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know, to be quite honest. Got one, right, we maybe got time for one or two more. So I'm gonna take one more question from the chat. I will allow one more hand up question as well if, if anybody is particularly opportunistic. So one more question from you, Sonia, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll go to Steve after that. And that, that unfortunately will be the end of the session then. Awesome, yeah. Um, we've got one here that's 
um, different kinds of light sources from moss traps, so slightly different UV spectra, are beetles attracted, attracted like to different wavelengths in particular? They're, they're, I don't know for sure which ones do what, but I know that moth trappers do report very different things in their trap. Um, UV lights in general um, tend to tend to be great for beetles. I think I think someone mentioned that um, LED stuff was quite interesting for beetles, um, but it, it just depends on the group, to be quite honest. And there there definitely is a difference. So that's one of the reasons that we want. Um, the type of light to be recorded so we can actually look at what is attracting what and what doesn't attract that because that's quite interesting information. There is some studies already on it and I've had a little gander of some of them um, but beetles do have a slight preference for, for certain types of light definitely. So in summary ask you again in five years when everybody here has submitted loads of data to you. There we are. You could be much more confident. Brilliant. Exactly. Um, right okay Steve um, can we get your question, please? Dan, when taking specimens out of moth traps, mm -hmm. there is a problem, particularly with pubescent species, for cleaning the scales of them. Can I ask how you manage that? I usually just give them a blow. I, um, I, I usually hold them, um, you can have a little pincer grip. Um, you could probably use a, a fine paintbrush quite easily as well. We'd probably do like slightly damp paintbrush and take that off, um, allow them to dry slightly. Um, because the colour can be changed um, on scales and things like that. But if it's if it's just pubescent, um, you could just give it a wipe, or you can just whack it in a little pot with a bit of, um, I don't know, a bit of tissue or something, and it, it should be able to clean it off a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare, and the amount of pictures you see, and you're like, I think it's this, but there's so much fluff on it um, from the way the moths have sort of shed their scales. Interesting, because I must admit, I don't find it particularly easy to remove the scales at all. And I was wondering if you actually migrated to move to a, an ultrasonic cleaner. No, no, not at all. I don't, I don't get anything fancy. I am a very much a, if I can't get it in the pound shop kind of guy, do I really want to be faffing around with it? So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dan. <laughs> no worries. Okay, I think on that note, we are running out of time. And there are just a couple of things that I want to mention. So I want to thank Dan very much. Um, and we, we can stop recording now as well, by the way. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things that 